Thank you so much uh, for the invitation, and it's my delight to share some of my research with you today. I had to adjust it a little bit because in the last two days we've had fascinating uh, talks on uh, mining, there was a mention there of artisanal mining, but uh, through, we've been hearing stories around stakeholder engagement, inclusive participation. We also had, you know, from up at the beginning, around this notion of deliber de deliberate, you know, from me, it's from a delib deliberative democracy kind of concept. And so I thought, mm, what should I do differently to represent social sciences, but also to begin to make sense of this question of how, how do you engage, you know, stakeholders? How do you, um, you know, ensure that we have bottom-up approaches? Because all these things that you've been introduced to, you know, the AA1000 stakeholder engagement standard and all that are the kind of things I call top-bottom kind of, you know, policy interventions, etc. So because of that, my uh, talk will be more uh, to tell you our story of what we are doing in Taitataveta County. And so the talk today is around um, strengthening collaborative action for sustainable artisanal and small-scale mining in Africa. And I'm cognizant of the fact that you know, the word sustainable, uh, together with mining, was a contested, or is a contested uh, concept. I mean, you've had the questions and the conversations in the room. And so for me, when I use the term sustainable in this context, I am including um, stuff around accountability, around responsibility, and sustainability, social sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. So what is artisanal mining, artisanal and small-scale mining? Um, I'm in a workshop where, you know, participants are looking at that big, you know, uh, sector. And it's very difficult to define ASM because it is very context specific. And uh, you can describe it using different characteristics, you know, from production engineering, market social labor uh, practices. Artisanal and small scale mining uh, is not just one thing. Uh, in some legal frameworks, it might be defined as one. In other legal frameworks or legal juri ju jurisdictions, you find that artisanal is separate from small-scale mining. But overall, uh, what I can say is that the sector is very, uh, the miners within that sector are very heterogeneous. Um, you, when you talk of artisanal, it's about customary and traditional means and ways of mining. And then uh, small scale, you're talking about low tech uh, mining processes. They are all quite labor intensive, mineral extraction and processing. And also we find that, you know, because of the contextual nature of it, you know, there are quite significant social and labor practices concerns and many other concerns as we shall see uh, in this session. But also it is important to note that, you know, ASM actually contributes significantly to employment, to income generation, you know, to foreign exchange um, in different countries. And in Africa, for example, you know, we are talking about a lot of people and, and nobody actually has a good, uh, accurate number of the many people that are employed in the sector. So 13 million is actually a conservative uh, number in my opinion. And out of all this, we find a huge percentage, uh, 70 to 80, is actually informal. And informality in the ASM sector, we are talking about a sector that is either not regular, uh, regulated, uh, it is not monitored, but also a sector that 
could have all these good policies, but the implementation of them is quite lacking. ASM is an important pillar in Africa mining vision, 2009, and uh, you find that ASM contributes actually a significant uh, proportion of uh, minerals, metals, uh, precious metals, and industrial minerals in Africa. So, for example, you know, we know that of the colored gemstones, with the exception of diamond, 80% is produced by ASM, and that is really significant. And then we also know that depending on the country in which this is mined, uh, some countries you know, ASM is a significant contributor. So like in Kenya, for example, uh, the gemstone sector that I'll be talking about today contributes 60% of all the gemstones produced in Kenya. And you can, you know, go on and on with all the statistics in different countries in terms of the contribution of a particular metal or precious stone or industrial mineral, you know, when you compare the contribution of large versus uh, the ASM sector. However, despite all this, we also know that because of its informality, it is really ASM sector in many countries is disregarded in regulatory and policy making processes. And a lot of the time, you know, a lot of the policies, a lot of the interventions are very top uh, down, you know, and, and therefore um, interventions are developed for miners rather with miners. And this for me is the big concern, you know, this notion of inclusive governance, you know, participatory governance. You know, with minors, you know, is all about that. And so um, I will be talking about the notion of with minors, how do we ensure that uh, these marginalized, you know, stakeholders in the mining sector are actually engaged, are included in the governance of natural resources in their uh, respective countries. We also uh, are very, you know, we all know of this, because this is the stories that are told of artisanal miners, you know, the ugly stories, um, where you hear um, their high exposure to occupational health and, and safety. We hear, you know, a lot of uh, stories around environmental risks. You know, the extreme poverty that these miners and the mining communities are, uh, have, you know, so it's, it's not just, it's, it's extreme poverty, meaning that, you know, uh, their day-to-day, -day, you know, living is, is really limited or their livelihood is really um, limited. Precarity of work, you know, um, gemstone may not have child labor compared to, let's say, incidences of gold mining in some countries. So we find, again, uh, minors do not really have access to social protection. And this is not just, might not be limited to minors themselves, you know, depending on the context you're, you know, you're operating in, governments more generally may not have the social protection. So it could be that the government does not have, but also it could be because where it is, because of the informality, they are not able to access the social protection. So the uh, case study that I'm going to share with you today is about you know, artisanal miners and small scale miners in Kenya uh, in a county called Taitataveta County. And uh, it produces 60% of the uh, colored gemstones that, uh, that are produced in uh, Kenya. It is a project funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund, and those are our partners at Itataveta University. It's a mining university in Kenya, uh, Nottingham, where I'm from. New Vic Borderlines is a theater uh, organization um, in, in the UK, and you will see why we used a theater company uh, to join us in this project. Just very quickly, in terms of artisanal mining, uh, it had been outlawed or it was not recognized in the mineral uh, 
regulation in Kenya for a very long time until 2016, when actually it, was, it became legalized. Uh, so it, it is now a legal entity uh, by law. However, as we know, um, since 2016, and this was my inspiration uh, for this project because I was involved in that process of developing the Mining Act and my contribution was around corporate social responsibility and the community development uh, related uh, policy issues. I found that uh, despite the Mining Act of 2016 and the policies that had been developed, um, a lot of things are still evolving around governance arrangements and there is significant implementation gaps. And just as an example, in the Mining Act of 2016, the artisanal mining committees were supposed to be formed and only in January 20, uh, 20, that date, 29 January 2021, was it gazetted? So you can see the implementation gap. And these committees are very important because they are supposed to start the um, legisl leg uh, legislating and ensuring that the artisanal miners are actually, you know, um, having licenses and stuff like that. So you can see even now, although it's been gazetted, the implementation of their mandate is still very slow. And so for us, it was really important, you know, to begin to think uh, how do we address these governance gaps? And uh, a collective action approach was the only feasible way of dealing with uh, the notion or the idea of sustainable gemstone mining future in Taita Taveta. And I'll speak a little bit more about this because it is very important, you know, we as researchers and academics, we sometimes use uh, methodologies that may actually not empower and give voice to the miners. I started by saying that we develop policies for miners and not with miners. And we are guilty as charged, you know, as academics, whereby we speak and talk to miners as respondents, as opposed to, you know, engaging them as partners in the knowledge creation. And this is a challenge that I want to pose to you all and us all for us to really think carefully and rethink how we uh, create knowledge, whose knowledge it is for, and for what purpose. So the methodology we adopted is one of participatory, uh, a participatory methodology called cultural animation. And this is where New Big uh, sec, uh, Center ca Theater comes in. And uh, my colleague, who was a co-investigator here, I was the PI in this project. They, uh, together with uh, Sue Moffat, uh, my colleague is Professor Mihaila Kiliman, uh, developed this uh, methodology, which is cultural animation. At the core of it is realizing and recognizing that artisanal miners and small-scale miners, whether they are educated or not, have lots of wealth of knowledge, and they know best. You know, they have indigenous knowledge. They know best how to deal with some of these issues. They might not be empowered, for example, they may not have the capital to buy, uh, you know, machineries, but actually when you give them, uh, you know, alternative ways of, you know, developing new technologies, they will work with you and, and develop sufficient um, approaches and interventions. So here we allowed them, we did not dictate to them what sustainability was. We allowed them to frame, to talk about it in the language they knew best. And uh, those are just some of the pictures uh, that we used. And we used storytelling. We are Africans, we love our stories. We love our poetry, we love our music, we love our dance. So we asked them, to imagine what 
responsible, inclusive, sustainable mining future is. Let me say we did not use these words. You know, we just asked them, what is your vision? You know, where do you want to see this sector? Where do you want to see yourself? So for us, this was our own, uh, you know, through this, their stories, we were able to, you know, package and, and begin to make sense of what they actually mean in the language that we know best, responsible, inclusive. But we asked them, so they, through stories, through, you know, music, through uh, role plays, they were able to talk about what their future is. But then for you to envision what your future is, you've got to also know where you are now. But the big challenge for us was how do we move from where we are now to the future? So um, we needed to also create safe spaces. Remember, for a very long time, these marginalized people were not really engaged in policy making. So they had this, you know, the policy makers there, we are here, never spoke to each other. There was a lot of mistrust, um, a lot of, you know, uh, this kind of barriers and separation. And what we actually did by, you know, allowing this methodology, it was a very playful approach of them beginning to solve their problem together. And so you can imagine a minister, going back to my, you know, um, pictures there, a minister of mining in the same room, in the same space, you're telling them and telling him to engage, you know, in a role play about the future of mining. So you can imagine all these uh, barriers, you know, power barriers, this bureaucracy hierarchy. You've got to actually get rid of all that and begin to be the same, to be in the same space. And because of that, you find that they actually begin to relate with each other in a different way. They start seeing themselves as partners in this process, you know? And so for us, that was very important because we really needed uh, all of them to be part of this we attitude or the collective attitude towards some uh, change. And uh, again, you know, um, utilizing boundary spanning objects to do things that you would normally do. So that there was an exercise around stakeholder analysis. You know, who are our stakeholders? So different uh, objects there were supposed to, um, to be representative of who they thought uh, their stakeholder was. So you can imagine sometimes someone would pick a horn and say, oh, this is um, large scale mining. So you ask, them, you know, they were asking them, so why did you pick a horn uh, to represent large scale mining? And you'd hear, oh, because, you know, they are very uh, rigid, they, they don't want to work with us, you know, so that's why I chose a horn, you know. Um, so you, those stories you could hear and pick out issues around trust, issues around who has the legal responsibility, who has the formal, uh, you know, contracts. Uh, or who has, you know, all these things. So we were able to really map out the relationships, the trust, the mistrust, the mandate and stuff like that. So this is in one of the reports we've shared uh, in terms of what they saw as the impact of ASM. And therefore what we did later on was to map it against the SDGs uh, because we needed to demonstrate how the artisanal mining in uh, Taita Tabeta was connected to Kenya's vision 2030. Because if you're going to uh, have a conversation with the government and ask for resources, you also must begin to speak the language of the government and demonstrate to them how artisanal miners uh, in the county level are connected to the national government. Uh, mining uh, processes. So that is a map in terms of the positive and the negative impact of what they perceived as the uh, positive and the negative impact they had on society, on uh, the environment and the economics. But importantly, 
I have already shared with you, you know, what they, they thought, you know, the vision of what sustainability meant for them. And they analyzed where they were at, you know, the mapping uh, of the SDGs. The big question for us was, how then do we move from the red um, place to the green place? And therefore, in the, uh, in the course of this project, we initiated a multi-stakeholder dialogue forum. And we launched it in uh, October 2020 as a platform for continuous dialogue, you know, for us to learn from each other. When I say us, is the mining stakeholders. And also as a platform in which we could build the capacity of actors and hopefully improve the resource governance, transparency, and accountability. We, that environment for dialogue and cooperation was extremely important. Because remember I said there was a historical um, experience of marginalization, of mistrust, you know, and lack of co cooperation amongst different actors. So promoting partnership was very important. And so we really invested a lot of time, you know, developing and maintaining relationships between policymakers and mining uh, stakeholders. So um, we also created uh, what is a multi-stakeholder dialogue secretariat, which represents all different actors. So there's a, represent, a representative from the government, the NGOs, the county government, from uh, high institutions of learning, such as ourselves, um, and from miners themselves. So they uh, nominated who should go in the secretariat, and the secretariat meets every month uh, to assess how we are faring on and how we are um, implementing the Taitata Beta Sustainable Mining Action Plan. And this action plan is a five-year strategy that was co-produced by the mining stakeholders themselves. And so again, the interventions are around five pillars, and I'll, I'll show you very briefly what these pillars are. And it is around economic development, social development, environmental stewardship, etc. So that is our vision of what a sustainable artisanal mining and small-scale mining looks like in Taitataveta district uh, county. And this is our theory of change. Um, I'll share this document. You can also see it in our website. You can download it from there. But essentially, you know, the, uh, our overall vision is to ensure that, you know, we have improved the well-being of miners and mining communities. We have also significantly reduced the negative socioeconomic and environmental impact and we are contributing to both the uh, county and the national governments in terms of economic development and the sustainable livelihoods uh, um, generation. And so the sustainability issues are around those five pillars that I mentioned. And then we are also saying that to ensure that uh, we are um, the ASM is inclusive, it is accountable, it is sustainable. We have to, to address the um, environmental factors. We also have to ensure that we develop what we call core strategies and also supportive strategies that will um, ensure that we are, you know, aspiring or at least uh, moving towards a more sustainable ASM. And this is what the action plan looks like. So if you think about different pillars, so the economic social governance, under it there are various interventions. So like if I look at the governance and partnership pillar there, this is an example. The multi-stakeholder dialogue forum was like a big action plan. Then under it 
there are different interventions. We have short-term, medium-term, and long-term plans towards it. We have ways in which we monitor the indicators. We have the various key stakeholders that you know, will be rallied around for the, that uh, thematic uh, focus to be delivered and the kind of human resources that we have. So this is just an, an example to show you something that we've already achieved in one of the governance and partnerships interventions. So when you look at something to do with uh, the social development, health and well-being is another intervention. So under each of the pillars you find uh, you know, some specific thematic focus and all of them follow the same patterns. So what we are saying is that anybody who is coming to work in Taita Taveta, whether you are a stakeholder within Taita Taveta or you guys and any future collaborators that wish to go to Taita Taveta, you have to look at this strategic action plan which has been signed off by the governor as the blueprint for development in the county. And they will ask you, you know, where do you see your, your you know, interventions or the kind of things that you want to work with us? You know, how is it aligned to this strategic action plan? And hopefully you will be addressing any of the, you know, interventions around the five thematic focus. So that is how, how the strategic action plan is. And another thing that we've been doing, because this is not a just a one-off process. Sustainability is a process. You know, it's not a destination. You can never reach it. It's a continuous process of engagement, uh, you know, monitoring, review. It is, we continue telling our stories. So public, uh, engagement is very critical for us because we've been talking here about public perception. You know, changing that perception, but also telling the stories in terms of what, what is happening uh, down there and the contributions that the artisanal miners are. So we have a gemstone uh, mining documentary. That is one of the uh, interventions that we had, and it was the responsibility of the higher education institutions that are actors in this space. So we produced that. We've had public exhibitions around artisanal mining in, in the region. We also ensured that, you know, we had a policy brief. It is the brief, the name of this talk that I have today, and we launched it in March 2022. But what we are trying to do is, in addition to, you know, uh, creating knowledge, we want to translate this knowledge in the ways that policymakers are able to, uh, to, you know, assess and hopefully influence policymakers from that angle as well. So you can visit, uh, that the policy brief can be downloaded through our website. And essentially we are, you know, it's bottom up, but ensuring that we are speaking to different people. We are speaking to consumers, we are speaking to policy makers, uh, we are speaking, the miners are speaking to themselves uh, and staff. So my concluding thoughts is that, you know, sustainable uh, and sustainability in the mining sector can only be attained, in my opinion, if we really co-produce and co-create new policies and practices. We can no longer be there, you know, creating policies for miners. We have to really begin to engage them as partners in development. And this requires us investing time and resources to build stronger relationships Co-production as a research process, I can tell you for free, for, you know, for the academics, it's not an easy thing for you to be churning out you know, publications every now and then. You know, it's not where you go regression analysis, voila, and you publish. It won't happen. So you really have to be in the space of engaged research and think about alternative ways of output, you know, from an academic perspective. One of the things that we really have to continuously work towards and be aware of is the politics in the mining ecosystem. 
politics at all levels, you know, politics amongst the artists from minors, you know, who is getting what, who is being favored, which cooperative, which circle, you know, those kind of politics. Meso level, we still, uh, we were unable to bring the big uh, mining companies, there are only two in, in Taitata Veta to really engage with us. They, we invited them, but they did not quite say no, but they did not show up. So again, that is the politics in terms of the integration. At the macro level, again, there is politics between county and national governments, but also minors at different levels, so it's a lot of layered complications. And we also have to navigate different cultures. You know, cultures may not necessarily be the tribal culture, but organizational cultures as well and continuously, you know, communicate, disseminate uh, evidence, and for us, change is important. One of the things that, as an academic, we are doing all these things, you know, we are framing, but now the conversation is moving towards, let's now begin to implement stuff. So we are starting to develop our new project, which is developing a trading app, so that they can begin trading, because remember the miners want to see a difference in their pocket. However much you develop these nice policies, you know, you frame, you do what, 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 what. At the end of the day, success means do they have food on the table? Are their kids educated? You know, do they have good roads? Do they have health care and stuff like that? So for me, really, it's a, a call to action to all of you in the room. If you feel inspired and you want to engage with us, there's a lot of room for partnership and, co co uh, you know, and, and, and cooperation. And uh, together, let's uh, work to support the artisanal miners and to ensure that they are moving towards that vision that they aspire towards. Thank you so much.